Hey, hello and welcome. We're going to get started in, let's say, about six minutes. I just want to give everybody a chance to join the room, but thank you so much for coming. Go ahead and share that. And it would be a, oh, oh hi. It'd be a huge favor to me if y'all could just go ahead and throw like a lowercase b in the chat, kind of like uh, this, if you're able to see the screen. Cool. I'm going to also interpret that as y'all being able to hear me. <laughs> Glad to hear everything is working. Uh, out of curiosity, where's everybody coming in from today? I'm in uh, Austin, Texas, here in the US. Love to hear about where everybody's coming from. Is somebody from India? King of Prussia, Pennsylvania? Quebec? Minneapolis? Kiev? Glad you can make it, guys. Lima? San Diego, <clears throat> Tel Aviv. Oh, I don't have my chat set to everybody. <laughs> Rotterdam, San Francisco. Spread out. Glad to see we got uh, like five continents represented already. <laughs> Uh, we'll start in about four minutes if you're just joining us. Um, would love to hear where you are calling in from. Go ahead and throw that in the chat. Bavaria, cool. Oh. It's odd. I can't actually see myself. Is my camera still working? Can I get a B in the chat if it is? I guess I updated Zoom and they, they did away with that. All right, fine enough. Cool, cool, cool. It actually might just be, let me, how about if I do a full screen share? Nope, same problem, okay. Go figure. It's better if we just do the browser window anyway. Alrighty, we're going to get started in three minutes. If you're just joining us, feel free to throw where you're calling in from in the chat. Love to see where everybody is from. San Jose, cool. Ooh. Not my standing desk today, so pull my stool back. France, Philly. Wurzburg. I can't pronounce German things. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sebastian, there will be a recording. Um, the last one we did, I did not upload. I will be uploading this one to YouTube. So you can find it at the Hello Paper Space YouTube. I'll share that link at the end of this uh, call. Uh, not the video link itself, but to the channel. Along with some other helpful stuff. <laughs> oh, you know, actually... I've got to get these slides for this to y'all. Let's, uh, there we go. Cool, I just shared the slides in the chat. You should all be able to access them. Uh, do do let me know in the chat if you're having any issues accessing the slides or seeing anything, and I'll do my best to resolve it quickly. Let's give it one more minute. 
Cool. Thank you, Andres. Cool. Everything seems to be working. Put on my slippers. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and estimate this presentation will be somewhere between 30 minutes and 45 minutes uh, for the main content. So I'd argue that the main content of this is, uh, you know, we're already at time, so I'll just get started. Uh, Bob asked how long this is going to take, and I'll just answer that with my intro. So hi, everybody. My name is James Skelton. I am uh, the technical evangelist for Paperspace, and today I'm going to be talking to you about deploying the Stable Diffusion web UI uh, with Paperspace Gradients deployments. Uh, this presentation is going to last, I, I guess, anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes for the main content. There will be a kind of additional section at the end, so to speak, where I'm just going to be uh, showing kind of some of the capabilities of the web UI. Uh, but that will be less, less, probably less valuable than the actual like tutorial on doing the deployment. So, uh, if you want to skip out after about 30 minutes, I think that would be fine. Uh, I will be uploading this to YouTube. So, uh, if you need to leave early, don't worry about it. This will be available at the hello paper space, YouTube. Cool. Uh, before we get started, I just want to introduce paper space, um, if you're not familiar, it's a platform for building and scaling machine learning applications. You can explore a new data set or a library in a notebook, automate pre-processing, training, or testing with a workflow, and bring your application to life with a deployment like we're going to do today. Um, I encourage you all to join our community of 500,000 users on Gradient. Um, there's so much you can do with just the free notebooks. Uh, in today's talk, we are going to start with a brief intro to Stable Diffusion, just talking about what it is, what it does. Uh, then I will go into um, creating a Docker uh, file and talk about what Docker is and talk about how to use Docker Hub. Um, we're going to discuss creating Docker containers for gradient deployments and useful packages for creating custom deployments. That's going to be in less in detail. Uh, then we're going to walk through uh, the steps for actually deploying the Stable Diffusion web UI. So we're going to walk through the Docker file I used to create the container, uh, walk through the steps for uploading and connecting uh, a model artifact from your local computer onto uh, Gradient with deployments, and then launching the Gradient deployment from both the GUI or the local terminal. Uh, afterwards, we will close uh, by looking at the web UI, talking about some of its capabilities, including the basic synthesis scripts and upscalers, uh, training capabilities, and some of the extensions that I think are worth your time. Uh, if you have previously used the Stable Diffusion web UI, this is an updated version. It is now not quite up to date. Uh, it's, I believe, one week out of date. I'm going to be updating it soon again but this version is still able to access most of the new features that have been released recently. So it, it's pretty pretty capable. And we'll talk about why it is not up to date. And um, that is one of the use cases actually for why you might want to redo this. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So first things first, uh, Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion was, uh, kind of the follow-up work uh, to release pre-trained models of uh, the latent diffusion models, uh, which were created by Runway ML, CompViz, and Stability AI. It was initially released on August 22nd, and the initial batch of training uh, was on the Leon 5 billion data set subset, uh, the Leon high resolution images, which consists of 170 million examples from Leon 5B, with a resolution greater than or equal to 1024 by 1024. Uh, we're actually currently on the seventh iteration of the public releases of Stable Diffusion, which is V2.1. We're not going to be using that today because uh, V2 was released the day after uh, this update was pushed, and it does not have the capability to use the config file that you need to use V2. Uh, but an update will be pushed soon to uh, implement that. Um, just for some context, uh, about this latest, um, oh, sorry, some, some more context about latent diffusion. Uh, basically what happens is the images are encoded through an encoder during training. 
and that turns them into these latent representations. Uh, the autoencoder then uses a relative downsampling factor of eight to map those images of shape height by width times three to latents of shape h over f times uh, height over f times width over f times form. Uh, I have a previous discussion and a blog post detailing what is actually going on in detail, and I'll share the link to that after this session is over. Um, so if you're interested in how stable diffusion really works, that will go into that in more detail. Um, one last thing before I move on from stable diffusion, I do want to mention the difference uh, between the newest model. Um, the newest stable diffusion model was trained uh, at the 768 by 768 resolution. This is the 2.1 version. Uh, and it was, um, it, it, it's, it uses X formers and it's, uh, oh goodness. Yeah, actually this isn't important. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Point is there's a new, the latest version is actually trained on a larger size. So the, the version we're gonna be using today is 512 by 512 size pixel. So you're, not recommended going above that uh, in when you're using the normal stable diffusion scripts. That's not so much a problem with the web UI. Uh, the newest version is 768 by 768. So it's actually optimized for larger files. So um, you can use that if you are interested in generating larger images with your stable diffusion. All right, enough on that. Um, let's talk about Docker. So uh, Docker is a set of platform as a service products. I've got my mouse. There we go. A series of uh, set of platform as a service products that use OS level virtualization to deliver software and packages called containers. If we look over on the left uh, on this image, I got an example in the left hand side of that uh, little diagram showing how that looks for containerized applications. So that is an entire uh, hardware infrastructure. And we can see that there's numerous apps that are kind of lying on top. Um, a Docker container image is a lightweight standalone executable package of software that includes everything needed to run an application. This is code, runtime, system tools, system libraries, and settings. Uh, when you have created a container, you can push it to the public Docker Hub repository. Um, uh, to access it with uh, cloud services like Paperspace, um, and I'll show you briefly how to do that in a little bit. Uh, all you need is an account and you can have up to 10 repos on Docker Hub. So uh, it's it's pretty user friendly. Um, and finally services, yeah, services like Paperspace use these containers to package everything we need to run software like the stable diffusion and other deep loading models. And we actually use it for both our notebooks, workflows and uh, deployments products. Um, and it's a really nifty way that you can quickly put some customization into what you are working on um, with the cloud. Uh, I want to draw attention really quick because I, I didn't cover it uh, to the other example uh, in that right hand side of that diagram. Those are uh, virtual machines. You can think of them as actually virtualizing an entire machine down to the hardware layers, whereas the containers only virtualize software layers above the operating system level. So that's a good way to remember and distinguish between the two. All right, next. So uh, creating Docker containers for gradient deployments. Um, since gradient uses these containers, we need to walk through the steps for creating a Docker container for deployments if this is gonna be a thorough tutorial. Uh, the first, we need to, uh, first thing we need to do to do that is to install Docker on our local machine or a paper space core machine and turn it on. Uh, if you're on a MacBook, uh, it will show that it's running by an icon in the in the top right of your uh, toolbar at the top. Uh, I believe on Windows computers, it'll show in the bottom right. Um, once you have turned it on and it's running, uh, all we need to do is uh, open up our terminal um, and uh, navigate to whatever directory we want and create a new file called Docker file. So you can just do that with touch Docker file. And then you can open that in your favorite text editor. And I've got the link here, but we're gonna talk about what, oh, actually, yeah, never mind. Got the link there if you want to follow along, I'm just gonna show that on my screen here. So this is the Docker file I used uh, to create the uh, deployment we're gonna be using in this presentation. Um, 
there is two things I want to point out in particular, um, and that is just kind of basics about writing a Docker file. At the beginning of each line, you'll see it says from run worked or, or expose, and that's not all of the possible um, commands, but uh, it's the ones that you're likely going to be using in most of your Docker file writing situations, and they do different things. So from pulls from an existing container on Docker Hub so that you have all the things that come after it built on top of that. So this is the gradient base container that we use for most of our runtimes. And I'm building on top of that so that I have all the things that were already in that container in my new container. Next is run. Run is uh, used to execute code. Um, so in this case, I'm using pip3 to upgrade pip. I've got a bunch of other pip installs down here. I also use run to use apt in aria2c. Uh, and uh, make dir and ls. Uh, this is just for troubleshooting. Um, and you are able to uh, actually execute the things that are needed to install them on the container itself. Uh, next, we have work dir. Work dir, you can think of this as like cd in the terminal. It changes your working directory. Uh, and finally, expose. This exposes the port we want to be available on the container to be accessible. So uh, as I said, these, oh, these are just like environmental variables that correspond to different effects. Um, yeah, and they correspond to that order I list here, pulling from another container, executing commands, changing the working directory, and exposing the port of the container. Um, so next, let's look at what we actually have in here so we can understand what is required for running this application. Um, so this version is the uh, model included version. I've got two versions of this existing Docker container. This one has the model downloaded onto it. The other version does not. Uh, and you can see how they differ just by lines 14 to 16 here. Uh, if you remove this, you get the other version. So uh, the packages that we are using specifically for this uh, are all really contained in this section. Um, these are kind of the typical requirements packages that we need, like uh, Gradio and the fonts, basic SR, PyTorch Lightning, uh, Omega Conf, and INOPS. All of these help with different aspects of the process. Um, then we get to the specific dependencies for the Stable Diffusion Web UI. These are like K Diffusion, Taming Transformers, Clip, Diffusers. Uh, now that also includes Open Clip and um, Xformers. I'm working on getting Xformers integrated right now, actually. Um, and there's an additional requirements script, which just has a few things, which I, I found, oddly enough, wouldn't install on their own. So I had to use it through the requirements script. Uh, it, sometimes it can be finicky. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you are uh, having issues, try just playing around with how you're doing the installs. But uh, all together... Oh, and finally, uh, Stable Diffusion itself and GFPGAN are cloned. Um, our main uh, and the web UI itself and the working directory is the web UI. So everything is contained within that web UI directory um, in the exact same format that we would find it uh, in the automatic 111 GitHub itself. So it just looks like this, formatting wise. All right. So uh, as I said, there are two versions of this. There is the version with the model already up, which I showed you just now, and the version without the model included. If we have our own checkpoint, like a dream booth model or um, some fine tuned model that you particularly like, I'm trying to think of examples, like uh, I think Trina Art V2 is one. Um, you can use this to upload it and then connect the web UI deployment to that. This could be particularly useful if you're interested in doing some sort of production grade deployment with your own custom trained models. You may need to be able to put them in there. So this is super useful. Another thing is uh, these artifacts actually run faster uh, in my experience when uh, they're connected. I think that has to do with the way the volume is mounted in the connection um, between it and the, the storage, but I I'm not sure. Uh, so, whoops, sorry. 
So to actually do this, you need to first get a model checkpoint. Um, so it can be any checkpoint you want. Here is um, my console. You can just go into any project of your choice. I'm in my private workspace. I'm in this deployments tutorial project. And then I'm gonna go into this models tab here. Once you're there, I've got some existing models like this Stable Diffusion uh, Classic, which I'm gonna be using today for this uh, tutorial. And I've got some extras as well. Now to upload it, we just simply need to uh, just drag and drop or click on this to open our file, our local file navigator. And then we can put in our uh, .checkpoint file. We can name it however we want. And then uh, because this is running on Torch, we need to change this to say custom. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, it, it is a custom model type according to the gradient um, uh, system. So uh, if you follow those steps, then you can click upload. It'll you know take as long as it takes um, for your upload times. I recommend if you have uh, a serious number of these to do is just go and make a core machine uh they are very very fast so you could uh i uploaded the checkpoints here in less than a minute using a core machine and they're five three to five gigabyte files so keep that in mind if uh speed is important you could do that in less than you know a minute of core machine runtime <laughs> okay um and next you just need to change your YAML deployment spec to link to your model artifact. And I know I haven't talked about the YAML deployment spec yet, but that is what we use to actually tell the deployment what to do. Um, and here I've got two examples um, that do different things for your deployment, depending on what kind of deployment we are working with. And, uh, Sorry, I, I looked at the chat really quick and I got distracted. Uh, depending on which Docker file we're working with, if we're using the container that uh, has the model included, then we would want to use this deployment spec on the left. If we are using the one with no model and we're using our own checkpoint, then we will use this one on the right. Um, so walking through this, this is the image. This is the link to the Docker container on Docker Hub. So it's at the paper space Docker Hub at the repo stable diffusion web UI deployment and the tag follows v1.1 model included. Next, I'm telling it to connect to port 7860. And then we've got the command. Command is, um, if you're not familiar, it's it's similar to uh, those worked or run from, it's one of the doc, uh, Docker file, uh, I guess flags you would say, commands. Um, and what it does is it, oops, excuse me, it tells uh, what to do on, on startup. So when our container starts up, this command will execute and it has this odd formatting, I know, but it, you can think of it as just a, a typical terminal command where it goes across. So this is actually Python launch.py with the flags auto launch, listen, enable and secure extension access and port to connect to 7860. Uh, finally, we've got the resources. Um, I'm only, I recommend only using one replica because there is currently no multi GPU set up for stable diffusions web UI, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, and I, I, my recommendation is an a 4,000, but, uh, you should be able to get the web UI to run on any paper space GPU, including the M 4,000. But, uh, for the price of the M 4,000, you're better off using an a 4,000 at about 10 cents more an hour. Uh, so my recommendation there for sure. Um, next, uh, on the right, we have the equivalent for, uh, when we don't have our model included and there's a few extra steps. First, we have this additional, uh, checkpoint flag and that is pointing to, uh, uh, it's outside of our working directory. So one level back in opt, and then we, it'll automatically put your model artifact when you connect it this way to the uh, model ID it has in the project slash the checkpoint file name. Uh, so the name of the uploaded file. Um, then we need to set environment variables. So the model name 
just looking at this, the model name is what we have here, Stable Diffusion Classic. Then the, uh, so it's the name you gave to the model artifact in the console, it's the name in gradient. The model file is the file name for the model. So uh, that would be in this case, one v15 pruned EMA only dot checkpoint. And finally, the model dir, uh, as we said before, is opt slash model ID. And uh, it, it knows to connect at the uh, root. So you don't need to include anything to make it go back a level. Then we put in the uh, models here with the ID and the path to it. Again, it understands the whole root aspect thing on its own here. Um, the only reason we have to have this dot dot here is because uh, the working directory is one level in to the stable diffusion web UI directory. Um, and that will connect your model checkpoint. You can do this with any model checkpoint file. All you have to do is just copy and paste what I have here and uh, replace the values uh, that you can just get from here. So for example, my model ID is that. I would just paste that in everywhere it says model ID um, and do the same for the other values. Um, that will let you get any uh, stable diffusion checkpoint you want. Um, that could be dream booth. Um, it could be fine tuned stuff in there. And that is very useful. Uh, really quick, I, I noticed a few questions. I'm sorry I haven't been answering them. I'm just going to take a moment to answer them. Uh, Andres asks, you can always use super resolution to increase the image size. Yes, that's correct. Uh, it also, uh, beyond just doing super resolution, I, I believe they also have, uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but it, it, in the uh, prog rock diffusion, it was called the go big method, where it would kind of uh, generate uh tiles and then combine the image together in a way that um uh, uh doesn't it's kind of like fine tuning or fine tuning is a difficult word to use in uh deep learning sorry but like kind of uh adjusting small sections of the larger photo after the initial generation to better approximate it if it were the correct size yeah that's it uh so you could do it uh, you can also run stable diffusion uh, synthesis with GFP GAN and Codeformer working and all the other upscalers they have. I believe there's like real ESR GAN and a uh, few others that do background upscaling and stuff like that. So yes, and in a nutshell, you can always use super resolution to increase the image size. And if that's not enough, you can then upscale it further. Um, from the base Docker image, it seems that TF29 and JAX0314 are not needed. That's correct. Um, I just didn't have an existing version without those, and I wanted to do this quickly. But you're right. You could make a lighter weight version of this without TensorFlow and JAX. Um, and will I share the link for Stable Diffusion? Yeah, sure. Whoops. So here is the link to the uh, Gradient AI Stable Diffusion page. Oh, whoops. Sorry about that. And uh, I was actually going to point this out later, but uh, it's it's a good enough time now as any. If you, if you click on uh, this link right here in the README that says Run on Gradient, it will open the uh, Stable Diffusion notebooks. We've got a Dream Booth notebook, a Textual Inversion notebook, and a standard uh, just kind of stable stable diffusion notebook uh, in here. Um, and this is actually another way you can access the web UI. And if you need to access the latest version of the web UI, this version will always be up to date uh, just because of the way it works. Just letting this load really quick. Sorry, everybody. I guess something's... Oh, it's probably probably because I'm zooming, but things are a little slower. All right. Well, it seems that it doesn't want to load for some reason. Oh, the instant I press that. Okay. There we go. So if you want to uh, launch the Stable Diffusion web UI, uh, we have actually connected. Uh, well, you can't see it right now. Sorry. I I've made the... Uh, 
different checkpoints available as public data sets. So all you have to do when you open up the notebook is click this data sources tab, click the public button, and then mount them. And then you can access the V2 version or the V15 version of the, uh, the uh, stable diffusion models in the web UI. Uh, yeah, that's fine, Pierre. Pierre Luc, sorry. <laughs> that is totally fine. Um, I I intend to create a community for everybody in the near future. So look out for invitations to Discord from uh, the uh, emails. Uh, all right. So yeah, if, if you want to quickly launch the web UI, this is another method you could do it. And I just wanted to point that out. It works on any GPU, free GPU, uh, paid, whatever you want to use. Uh, and it has the capability of working with the V2 models, which I think could be of interest uh, to people here. So let's get back to here. Um, so as, as, as we've walked through all of this, we can now see that um, uh, the steps to actually doing the deployment itself, not too complicated once you have everything put together. This is actually just really a copy and paste. Uh, depending on how you want to do it, it can be very, very it's as simple as you want to make it, so to speak. Um, so there's two ways you can actually launch the deployment. Um, the first is using the CLI. Uh, you can get the gradient CLI on any uh, terminal just by doing pip install gradient. Uh, very, very easy. Uh, and then log into your gradient account by doing gra gradient API key, your key. You can get your key by clicking in here and going to team settings. And then API keys. And that will get you uh, your API key so that you can work with the gradient CLI. Uh, then you need to create a .yaml file with whichever spec you plan to use. So whichever one of these two. Uh, and make sure that you are in that directory. Uh, and then you just need to put in this command into your terminal. So gradient deployments create, and then the name, whatever you want to name it. So maybe stable diffusion deployment, uh, can't be capitalized, can't use spaces. Uh, then the project ID, you can get your project ID just by going into any project. And then it's up here on the top left. You can just click that to copy and paste it. Then the spec. So this is just the path to your spec file. This is why I had you navigate to the directory with the spec file. Uh, you just need to put whatever that name is. So uh, if you are using the one that we were using for this tutorial, uh, you can actually get all of this just by cloning this repo, get the spec, get this Docker file. Um, it is just spec.yaml. Right here, and it's actually out of date. I need to put in one update. It doesn't need this share anymore, and I've added uh, access to the uh, the extension. So it, use the one in the slides for now. Uh, then finally, you de delete your deployment with uh, gradient deployments delete, and then the ID of your deployment. Uh, you can always you can also uh, use gradient deployments update, which will push an updated uh, version of your deployment script. So if you've edited your deployment script and saved it, it will start a, uh, restart your deployment with that new deployment script. Um, additionally, we can also do all of this in the GUI. So uh, I want to actually walk through the steps for this. Oh, got a message invalid instance type for team subscription when trying to deploy it on the gradient GUI. Ah, excuse me, y'all. That is my bad. Uh, let's see. So that has to do with the, let me just change that right now for everybody, honestly. Um, let's change that back. Let's just do a P5000 for now. That has to do with the, uh, the type of account you have. So, uh, where is it? I believe... Oh, goodness. Getting started, maybe? Thanks for bearing with me, y'all. Ah, here we go. 
So uh, gradient has different pricing and different GPUs are included uh, on there. Let's see, should be, the full list is in the docs. I just didn't, uh, uh, paper space, gradient. I think it's data. Or no, it's machines. Ah, pardon. Having your docs memorized is a challenge, let me tell you. All right, here we go. There we go. Okay, so this, this determines what uh, type of machines are accessible depending on your plan. So it looks like actually RTX 4000 is the best for our free, uh, free account users. You still have to pay for these uh, uh, GPUs, by the way. There is no free GPU on deployments. Just keep just heads up to that. You can launch the web UI for free using the free GPUs in the notebook using the methodology I showed you earlier. Um, but just keep that in mind. Take this with a grain of salt uh, that this will uh, cost, let's see. What is the pricing for the RTX? 56 cents an hour to uh, run in its current format. Cool. It's good that you got that, Sebastian. I'm not sure what that is. Um, okay, so back to actually doing this. Sorry about the wait. So uh, to... Yeah, we can just go into any project we want. So I'm in my deployments tutorial here, then click the deployments tab. And I've already got this running just as an example, and then click create. This will take you into the create a deployment page. Uh, this has a way to fill in all the same information that we saw in our uh, spec here, just you know, spread out into a web interface. So, Let's look at what that looks like when it's completed. For my example, I'm going to use a A180 gigabyte uh, for this just because it's the fastest and I can. It's great. Um, then for my image, oh, it'll tell you, it should be able to tell you what will be available to your account, by the way, when you click on this GPU button here. Uh, if you're on a free account, it should lock out everything except for the RTX 4000 and M4000. No, it won't. All right. I'll report that up to engineering. Uh, so keep that in mind. If, if you are on a free account, um, you are going to be limited to those that are listed here as being in the no plan required section. Um, oh, sorry. Tried to paste that. It did not save. Let's go. There we go. Okay. Uh, there is a link to that doc page if you are curious about reading more about it. Huh. Oh, Uma, that that won't stop the code from running. It's it it's just a dependency error, but it, it still works. Uh, okay, so I'm going to continue walking through this now. But thanks so much for coming. Um, the container image we are using is the paper space slash stable diffusion web UI deployment colon v1.1. So that is the exact same as what we have uh, for here. So we know that we're going to be using the model artifact version because the model isn't included. Uh, next, we're going to expose port 7860. And then I've got the exact same uh, content that was in our uh, spec, but just put into a normal terminal command. Like if you were to launch this from just a Linux VM, this would be how you would do it. Uh, so we are doing launchbot.py. We're using auto launch. We're telling it to listen so it'll know to uh, connect to our um, endpoint. Uh, we're enabling insecure extension access so that we can have extensions. Uh, keep this in mind. This will make it possible for people to get into your web UI deployment. It's extremely unlikely. I've never had it happen, and I do this all day, every day. Uh, but keep it in mind. Uh, we're going to expose port, uh, port 7860, and we are linking to our checkpoint, which is, again, one level back from our working directory at opt 
then our model ID, and then the model file name. We are then clicking add to add in these three uh, environment variables, model name, stable diffusion classic in my case, model file, and model ID. Include that slash opt when you do the model ID. And finally, there's an option to select our model, add a model. Um, it'll, let's see, yeah, just that. Make sure that you have the right one with this ID, and then you can hit deploy to spin it up. Uh, I've got a request to share the slides. Let me do that. Uh, so when you hit deploy, it'll take uh, it'll take about a minute to say that it is ready. Uh, if you were to then, so here here's what it'll look like when it's ready. I, I created this over an hour ago, so it's it's long been ready. It'll take about a minute to set up, which is pretty quick. But then it'll take another minute and a half or so to actually do the uh, setup. So here are our logs. You can just click on this to view what's going on inside the deployment. For some reason, it was looking at model.checkpoint. Oh, this is from an old version. Excuse me. <laughs> I didn't have the right uh, arguments when I first initially launched this. So here it is with the right arguments. You can see it takes a few a minute or so between 15, 53, 1611, download everything. It'll actually finish the download. Uh, you know, oh, it did not want me to keep scrolling for some reason, but it finishes the download some minute later or so. And uh, then as soon as that's ready, the, the model checkpoint will be loaded in. And then you will be able to access your endpoint by clicking on this link here. So uh, if we, if I were to click on this link, it'll open something that looks like this, our stable diffusion web UI. And that is, that's really the full process. Um, from here, you can do everything, including add extensions, uh, do training if you want. Uh, it's going to be a little more difficult to get files in here. Uh, you may have to do training on, um, uh, images you generate directly, uh, just one of the ways this is going to have to work, but uh, it is relatively fully functional. Um, now, uh, this is the end of the how to deploy part of this. Um, in the next part of this talk, I'm going to go over uh, just some of the capabilities that I think are interesting about the web UI. Um, if you're interested in creating production grade deployments with the web UI as a basis, um, consider sticking around, learning about what some of these are and thinking about integrating them into your production environment. So let's go back to the slides. Oh, I hit start from beginning. Unfortunate. Let's see, where are we? Cool. Oh, extra line there. Uh, so I didn't want to spend too much time on the basic synthesis scripts and upscalers. I figured that this was information that uh, people generally would know about, um, but I'll, I'll go into a little more detail about them than it is listed here. So first is text to image. Um, this generates images from prompts. Pretty, pretty straightforward. You input some sort of prompt. Um, Stable Diffusion actually lets you input a negative prompt, which does the opposite. It's things that it, you don't want to see in your generated uh, as well. So we input this prompt and we put in our settings. Uh, there's a plethora of different sampling methods. Um, sampling steps go all the way up to 150 in here. Uh, you can adjust the height as much as you like. So let's just do, let's do a big one. Um, and uh, you can also affect the config scale. This determines how closely it will try to stick to the configuration. Batch count determines how many um, cycles of sampling uh, processing, processing is done. Batch size is how many images are generated uh, per cycle. Uh, then we've got the seed. This allows you to control randomness and stuff like that. So when we put it all together, We can generate our new fake Pokemon. Oh, that's a terrible one. It's getting much. I like that last one more. 
All right, here's some here's some fake Pokemon for you. Um, you can input whatever you like. Uh, I've always liked uh, doing this one. Um, but yeah, I really recommend playing around with this. Uh, it's a really, really cool way to generate just about anything. That lay on 5B data set is extensive. Uh, next, we've got image to image. Uh, this is similar to text to image. You use a prompt to generate a new image, but we are using an, an initial image as our uh, primer for synthesis. Uh, if you did not attend any of our previous lectures, um, in a nutshell, what's going on with diffusion models is it is trained to go from random noise to an image containing the features described in a prompt. So when we are doing image to image, rather than using completely random noise, we are actually using that inputted image as the initial image. Um, this allows you to kind of guide the way your synthesis will work. So um, it's common to do like, you know, uh, I think the common example is to do like a watercolor painting or a very rudimentary MS paint cover uh, color painting of like a landscape and telling it to uh, make a fully detailed landscape. Uh, and I've got an example here. Um, where I'm just using a, I, I googled tree. This is the first picture that comes up when you when you Google tree. And I told it to make an int from the Lord of the Ring films by Peter Jackson. And you know, I'm actually kind of happy with it. We can see that not a whole lot of the traits from the initial were carried over. Um, that's because when you're doing this, you actually have something called denoising strength. And this determines how much of the initial image is kind of conserved uh, or carried over in the process. So if I were to put this down to point three, I get a very different set of images. <laughs> Obviously they have different seeds, so they're gonna be different anyway, but uh, it'll retain more of the original features and have a harder time imparting what we want it to. So I could try to put a Lord of the Rings fellow here. <laughs> Um, so sometimes when you're working with image to image, it's about finding a, a sort of sweet spot um, where the effects are carried over without kind of ruining the intention of the prompt. Um, I'm not sure if it actually worked there. Looks like it didn't. Yeah, those are the same. Ah, there it goes. So here's. 0.5 instead. Yeah, it looks like it's trying to make a fantasy tree rather than an int. Um, possibly doing something more descriptive would help, like throwing in a, a, a humanoid. Oh, gosh, sorry. Humanoid based int from Lord of the Rings. I don't know. Um, but uh, image to image is really cool because you can impart that higher degree of control. Um, okay, there we go. So now we're starting to see some of that. It's not loading quickly, sorry. There we go. A little more along what we want, but still not quite there. Looks like a little Groot guy down there. All right, oh, I've spent too much time bogged on this. Um, Next, uh, GFPGAN and CodeFormer. Um, I'm just gonna lump these two together, but if you go to the extras tab, uh, here I have an example photo I made of uh, Chris Pratt as Super Mario using the Super Mario movie 3D stills. Uh, had way too much fun trying to make that happen. Uh, and here you can choose uh, how much to scale to or scale by. So you can choose an exact size or go up in 0.05 increments in size. So let's just make this two times bigger. Uh, can you view the resource usage in real time? I actually think that right now the metrics are not working efficiently, unfortunately. Um, it does work in the notebook version. So if you are in the notebook version, you can look at a uh, metrics tab, but currently, I don't think so. It looks like it's giving me, uh, consistent uh, usage across here in the metrics tab. I know engineering is working on this right now. Um, 
uh, if you want to be able to view your resource usage in real time, do the notebook version of this. Um, it, it, it's functionally the same. Okay. Uh, you can then choose from any of these different upscalers for the uh, backgrounds um, and uh, GFP GAN or code former for faces. Uh, since this is not a actual human's face, it's going to do something really weird if we put up a bunch of code former. So I actually want to see what happens. Um, <laughs> one other, oh, didn't, uh, didn't mess with it too much. That's nice. Good. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, that is uh, how you use the extras. You, additionally, uh, if you wanted to do that um, with a prompt, you can actually use the SD upscale additional script here. Um, and it won't have the face upscaling, but you can then run this and upscale the image uh, to twice the dimension, dimension size or however, yeah. Looks like yes or again four times, so maybe even four times as well. Um, and this is useful if you want to uh, generate a bunch of small images and then scale them up. Uh, I will upload it to YouTube. Do not worry. Thank you for coming. All right. Next. Uh, so uh, kind of the big thing and uh, in the Stable Diffusion community for the last couple of weeks it has been uh, fine tuning. Um, so that is you know, creating your own custom models or uh, even uh, to an extent textual inversion embeddings that will allow you to get exactly what you want uh, from your uh, model synthesis. Um, there are two ways really to do this that are directly implemented in stable diffusion. Um, the first I don't actually recommend, I haven't had very good success, um, and that is training a hyper network or embedding. Um, these in, these integrated ones, I, I haven't had as much luck as doing it uh, using a uh, notebook version like in the stable diffusion runtime we have in our notebooks. So keep that in mind if you intend to use a custom model. Um, or, or to train a custom model, I should say, you're, you're actually probably better off doing that in a notebook and then porting it over here. Uh, nonetheless, uh, directly integrated are the ability to train embeddings and hyper networks. And I'm gonna just talk about what those are really quick. Uh, an embedding is the result of textual inversion, which tries to find a specific prompt token or actually create one sometimes for a model that will create images uh, with features similar to your training data. The model itself is unchanged, so you can use it with any model that works with that embedding size. So uh, a 768 uh, embedding, so like a V2 embedding, will not work with a 512 embedding, and vice versa. So uh, keep that in mind. Or, or I mean, I'm sorry, not with a. They won't work with the model, so they have to be the same size model and embedding in order to work with one another. Excuse me. Uh, but functionally, they're two separate things. Uh, and you can think of an embedding as basically just a new keyword, which will be interpreted by the model to create the features of the very precise prompt. Um, so the uh, classic example they use for uh, this was the cat. Um, I've actually got a tutorial. Do, do, do. I actually have these linked in the slides at the very last page. If you want to do this on your own, showing how you can uh, make your own textual inversion, I used uh, pictures of Groot from the Guardians of the Galaxy films and uh, combined it with a Dream Booth model. You can actually get to the uh, Dream Booth version of this, uh, I think, just by doing that. Oh, no. It's linked in there. Uh, it's linked in the slides. So if, if you want to train a Dream Booth or um, uh, embedding, you can do it this way. Uh, the Dream Booth extension is actually pretty good, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, next is hyper networks. Uh, unlike an embedding, a hyper network is a uh, small network that generates the weights of a much larger network. 
Um, and the behavior of the main network is the same with any usual neural network, and it learns to map some raw inputs to their desired targets. Whereas a hyper network takes a set of inputs that contain information about the structure of the weights and generates the weight for that layer. So the hyper network will skew all your results from the model uh, towards the training data. So the way it works, uh, uh, rather than adjusting how the prompt is affecting things, instead, you are kind of priming the stable diffusion pipeline with the weights from our fine tuning of the hyper network. Um, and that allows it to get um, much better customization um, when working with the model prompts. Uh, next, I want to talk about extensions. Um, we can access these with this extensions tab. You can click uh, the available and then load from. And because we launched this with our uh, enable insecure extension access, these will all work. Uh, in particular, I want to call attention to Dream Booth um the image browser uh i didn't include this but i'm gonna talk about deform because it's really cool uh the embeddings editor yeah those are the four uh thank you very much for coming okay it looks like these can only uninstall one at a time um <clears throat> and Sorry, everybody, should have done this beforehand. Okay, once they've all installed, you can go back to this install tab and then click apply and restart UI. This may take a minute, but. There it goes. And now we've got our new extensions included at the top here. Um, so first is Dream Booth. Uh, this allows you to fine tune a model to a specific object, scene, or subject, uh, allowing complex subject recontextualization, text guided view synthesis, appearance modification, and artistic rendering, all while preserving the subject's key features. I personally think Dream Booth is the best way to fine tune a uh, stable diffusion model, and I recommend either using, uh, I've had less success with the Dream Booth version from here, but uh, it's still good. The one in the notebooks works better. Uh, so uh, if, if you intend to train a Dream Booth model, my recommendation is to use this uh, version from the, the slides, but uh, they should both work fine. Um, next, uh, 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 I actually don't think that it installed. It can be a bit finicky. Yeah. No, it's there. Huh. Very finicky. All right, while it's loading, I'll walk through the others. Uh, the embedding at... The embedding editor uh, allows you to edit an existing textual inversion embedding file, and it has like a bunch of sliders. Uh, it's like a multitudinous slider, so many sliders. Uh, these are opaquely labeled. Uh, and, and so this is still being developed in, I think that's exactly right, Gaspard. Uh, but if you mess around with it, you may be able to uh, edit your embedding to get closer to what you desire. Um, Let's see if this is up. Yeah, I'm not, it's not showing the dream booth for some reason. Sorry about that, y'all. So I guess I can't show that one, but uh, the embedding editor is here. We can see all of these different sliders. So if I were, I don't have an embedding loaded here, but if I were to have one, you could do things like change all these different values and then use the exact same seed to look at how, you know, your uh, person, how your prompt changes. Uh, this is, it's pretty cool, but it, it's, it's very confusing as of right now. I mean, it's, it's quite a lot to get through. Um, and it's going to take a lot of work to get down to exactly what you want with editing, uh, your embedding. Um, so look out for updates in the future that'll improve this. I'm sure somebody's working on it. 
Uh, next, the image browser. Uh, I like this one a lot. Oh, oh I guess I don't have anything. <laughs> Just wondering what was going on. Here we go. I don't recall generating this dwarf holding a football, but there, there it is. Do one of you have my link? That's, that's amusing. Um, I, I didn't, <laughs> didn't generate these, but uh, I guess the image browsers put it on there. Um, so yeah, these are, uh, this is a way you can edit, you can look at the images you've already generated. Uh, this is really useful in the deployments context because you can't actually look at your file navigator. Uh, and finally, there's a bunch of inspiration tools and localization extensions. Uh, I want to draw attention to in particular, oops, sorry, wrong tab. Ah. This inspiration script is pretty nice. Uh, I also liked artists to study. Style pile. Um, and shift attention. These can all let you do some pretty interesting stuff to kind of help randomize what you are doing and, and, and put in some different effects and try and gutsy up your work, so to speak. Uh, lastly, there are the extensions for localization. Let's just get rid of everything but those. So if you would prefer to work with the web UI in simplified or traditional Chinese, Korean, Spanish, Italian, German, Japanese, Brazilian, Portuguese, Turkish, or Norwegian. Uh, this is how you would do so. Uh, this can be really useful. I know everybody's used to having to code in English, but uh, this is my recommendation if you prefer those languages to install one of those. Uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that's really all I have for today. Um, we're actually just at time, but I'm going to call attention to these links uh, really quick. Uh, that part one. Um, oh, you know, I don't have the link here for the dream booth. Let's add that in. Uh, cool. And now I will share this again in the chat. Cool. Yeah, this has been a really, really great session. I really appreciate everybody's attention and energy here. I, I really hope that this has proved to be helpful. Uh, I will be uploading this to YouTube, like I said, in the near future. I just, just noticed my poster. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I'll be uploading this to YouTube in uh, the near future, probably Monday, if I had to guess. Um, but all the content that I went over is in the slides. So you should be able to just follow those along to recreate all the steps we did here today. I encourage you all to mess around with this. Um, if you are interested in making your own deployment for Stable Diffusion, I think this is kind of the, the top dog uh, place to start with the web UI. Um, other examples are like fast stable diffusion, which I think just builds off of this one. Um, I think Progrock diffusion is still going. Uh, might be worth checking those out. But yeah, I really appreciate all your time and your attention. And I, uh, yeah, I wish you the best of luck. I hope you all try it with us. Uh, definitely, uh, if you need to run this for free instead, check out the notebook version. We've got that on the free GPUs. Um, very easy to set up from there as well. So, yeah, I will call it here. Thank you, everybody, so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, hope you uh, get a chance to play around with this some more. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, got a question. Uh, could you briefly discuss the pros and cons of running in this deploy mode versus Gradio from the current notebook? Ah, OK. In a nutshell, thanks for the great question. Um, sorry, I forgot to ask for questions. If anybody else has any questions, let's uh, let's have them now. I'll try and rack them up quickly. Uh, 
I would argue that running this as a deployment is advantageous if you need to make this uh, accessible by other parties. That is the main situation where you would want to do that. So if you wanted to create a way where you could have a uh, always open website where people could spit out their uh, stable diffusion stuff, or you know, you wanted to make a, a you know a service involving this, I would recommend the deployment. Uh, the notebook mode is really nice for development because you can play around with stuff in there. Um, you can edit the actual scripts for the web UI, the deployment itself, and uh, use the terminal to bring in whatever model checkpoint files you want more easily. Um, it's all more robust and editable in the notebook, but it is better as an accessible resource as a deployment. I hope that answers your question, Michael. Beauty. All right. Any more questions? All right. Thank you. Give it. I'll give it 10 more seconds to make sure nobody else gets in the last question. All right. Looks like we are good. Look out for the recording of this on YouTube and more. Oh, best way to ask a question offline. Um, I would just contact support. You could try reaching out to me at uh, my email, but I, I'm admittedly very, very busy. I don't know if I'll be able to get back to you very quickly, but there's my email. All right. Time to go. Hope everybody has a wonderful day, weekend. Uh, I guess it's, you know, New Year even. I may not see any of you until next year. So goodbye. Have a good New Year.